Monday night at 8 p.m. here at the Des Moines Film Society. Uh, I'm joined once again by Olivia and by Clinton and Nicole uh, down in the lower left-hand corner there. Uh, so uh, this week, uh, we, we are going to be talking about uh, Night of the Hunter, uh, primarily. Uh, we thought this would be, uh, we actually put this one out to a vote uh, because we're showing Corpus Christi in our virtual cinema right now, which is a film about a young man pretending to be a priest. We uh, threw out some options for other uh, films about fake priests, and uh, this was the winner. So we're going to be uh, talking uh, about this film here tonight. We're also going to talk about Extraction, uh, which is the new Chris Hemsworth vehicle on Netflix. And uh, I thought it might also just be interesting to talk about kind of Netflix movies in general and, you know, kind of what that what that looks like. So um, anyway, how are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. Pretty good. Normally I would be like, oh, it's Monday, but the days all blend together. So <laughs> yeah, I am. Pretty sure though that today is a day that ends in a Y. But that's about the certainty that I have. So yeah, yeah. No, I was reminded uh, that May is May first is on like Friday, and I was like, whoa, who knew? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, none of those things mean anything anymore. But I suppose we can, you know, drifting in an existential void. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. So, and on that note. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so um, so let's talk a little bit about Night of the Hunter. Had you guys you guys had all seen Night of the Hunter before? I assume, right? This was yeah. the first one for me, actually. Oh, it was. This was okay. not shown in any of my film classes in college or high school or anything, so I kind of missed it. Interesting. It was uh, a poor excuse, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, you got to discover somewhere. I um, so actually I saw this this film for the first time. My uh, I had a really good theater teacher in high school, and he showed it in his uh, theater class there, nice. and he used it kind of primarily to talk about lighting design, which you know cool. when you see the film, you get it. <laughs> um, but that was my first exposure to it, and then um, I uh, I, te I taught intro to film classes at colleges for years, and it's one that I often use in an intro to film class because it's just there's so many great kind of particularly the design elements are a lot of times are what I focus on, but. I mean, it's definitely a film that kind of fires on all cylinders. So uh, I don't know, Clinton and Nicole, you guys had seen it before. You said you own the criterion of it, right? Yeah, um, I can't remember exactly when I first saw it. It was probably early college for me. I'm probably on TCM, but I actually ended up showing it at the UNI Film Appreciation Club of which I was the president. And I remember um, at the time because I would usually ask everyone in attendance if they had seen the movie that we were watching that night and to raise our hands and nearly no one had raised our hand. Like, I think I might've been the only one who had watched Including it. Including me. Yeah. And, <laughs> <Right. yeah. laughs> and so I felt pretty good that I had exposed a lot of people to this movie. Um, I think it should be more entrenched in the film canon, like uh, Casablanca or the Wizard of Oz or the Godfather, like these well-known classic films that like everyone knows who isn't even a cinephile. And I think it's on its way there, but it's not quite to that level yeah. of um, notoriety, I guess. But I think it's just as well, great as any of those. Yeah. Well, classic. and now that it's been featured on the Des Moines Film Society's Home Cinema Club live stream, I, yeah. think, I think we can say that it is. It is officially yeah. part of the- Truly like, a yeah. rocket up the charts. Yeah, yeah. It's in the so, canon now. Yeah. So we jump into the film itself because I'm sure that's we're gonna we're gonna talk about that for a while. But um, I, I just I wanted to tell this story because I, I I realize that this is a story that I know that not um, not a lot of folks know, but it's particularly of interest for us here in Des Moines, and that is that this film actually premiered here in Des Moines. So uh, Paul Gregory, the producer of the film, uh, is uh, grew up in Des Moines. I believe he's a Roosevelt High graduate. Um, he'd, uh, I, I know he, uh, I don't know his career. I don't know all the details of his career. I know he was out in Broadway and that's where he first started working with Charles Lawton. I think they kind of became producing partners. And then this was, uh, both of their first films. So it was Gregory's first film as a producer and, and of course, famously Lawton's first and only film as a director. And so, uh, Des Moines had hosted the premiere of, uh, State Fair, 
um, I want to say it was maybe around five years or so, five to 10 years before this. So they kind of put on an event like this before and uh, arranged something similar for Night of the Hunter. So these are just a couple of the kind of better photos from uh, the register right there. Um, uh, from the premiere, it premiered at the Paramount Theater, which was downtown on Grand Avenue, and um, had just a, I've seen lists of all the celebrities there, and I honestly can't remember because it's just, it's one of those kind of, um, just a, you know, huge, huge number of, uh, uh, of celebrities that were there for it. And then I think one of the coolest things uh, was the fact that uh, they, had a live simulcast of the tonight show from des moines that night um so and i believe it's still steve allen was the host at the time but they set up you know whatever uh you had to do to set up a satellite broadcast uh you know in the, in the 50s um and they broadcast that from des moines and then this is a screen grab here this is actually from the trailer they they kind of put in the trailer the the combined powers of paul gregory and charles lawton so even though it was their uh their first uh film together there um, you know, I think they were well known enough, uh, I guess, from their their Broadway work that that was that was kind of notable. And so, you know, in in the uh, canon of Des Moines film events, the uh, the world premiere of Night of the Hunter, I think, is probably right there at the top. So that's a, that's just a very cool Des Moines connection that the film has. But uh, I guess in terms of just thinking about the film itself, and I, I should mention too, uh, you know, anybody who's watching again. Uh, send us some comments you can type comments into the box there they'll show up here we can uh add them into the screen uh add them onto the screen for everybody to see it does take a minute for questions as they when people type them onto facebook to show up here um for us to pull them in so so get those in early i'd say in fact if you have anything to say about extraction go ahead and put that in there now too i've noticed a couple weeks we've kind of finished and then afterwards i look on facebook and there were a couple comments that people have posted that just didn't didn't ever get populated over so we would love to hear uh people's thoughts or comments on it but uh anyway let me throw it over to you guys what what kind of stands out to you about this film? Uh, and Olivia, since you just saw it for the first time, maybe maybe it'd be fun to start with you and just what, what jumped out at you. Man. I feel like the, um, the thing that jumped out at me the most is that I feel like there's a lot of, there's almost a lot of like respect for the audience in this that I don't often see not, I mean, in almost any film in general, but I, especially not in the sort of like thriller or like, I mean, I would almost classify it as a horror movie because I mean, it is like about mm -hmm. a serial killer and I think it has a lot of the same elements, but there's a lot of uh, respect for the viewer in the sense that it really doesn't plot everything out for you and it leaves it up to you to, to uh, read things that are implied or that are even just like hinted at honestly or are dropped and mentioned once. Because I mean, maybe I missed it because I was viewing it for the first time, but I didn't connect originally. I couldn't figure out why the father had been hanged. Cause I was like, I get that he's a bank robber or whatever, but like that doesn't seem like a capital punishment. Is this just like a weird past thing? And then it kind of dropped later that he killed a couple of people while this was happening. And then, so you're just connecting these dots as you go along and it's just dropping these little breadcrumbs that it trusts you to put together. <laughs> And it mm -hmm. tries to remember certain things and connect certain things and not in like a big reveal twist kind of way, just to like inform who the characters are and inform their, their inner lives, which I find to be like, I don't know, something you don't always see, certainly not in this genre. People are often mm -hmm. with a very broad brush. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I, I mentioned, I show it in an intro to film class and, um, you know, and these are usually their college students that they have some interest in film because they've chosen to take this class. But you're, you're dealing with a lot of kids who are relatively um, they haven't been exposed to a lot of films. And and in particular, a lot of times haven't maybe seen a lot of classic films, haven't seen a lot of black and white films, you know, these kind of things. And and they come in with certain uh, kind of preconceived notions about the, about mm -hmm. those films. And one thing I consistently hear from them from this is they're really just shocked at how sophisticated and how dark this film mm -hmm. is you know i think we sometimes just because of the production code and just some certain customs sometimes you look at older films and they feel that you, you can have the sense oh they're old-fashioned or they're kind of 
you know, they don't have maybe the depth that films do these days. But of course, when you look at a really great film like Night of the Hunter, it's like, wow, this is, you know, this was pretty sophisticated stuff. So, um, so it's always a good one, I think, to introduce people to, to classic film, black and white film, etc., and kind of surprise them at like, oh, wow, yeah, like they were, you know, even, you know, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, you know, whatever they were, you know, they were dealing with some stuff. So <laughs> well, um, it's, kind of, I mean, it's kind of like if we thought like every song from the 50s was like, how much is that doggy in the window? It's like, exactly. there, it's just it's it's the most cliche thing we can think of. But there is a lot of other content that's like pushing boundaries and really experimenting with things. And I think that's this is a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I have two know. notes on that point. If you don't, if you have time, yeah. um, you said genre, Olivia, which is interesting because, like, this is yeah. like so many genres: For thriller, sure. horror, romance. Maybe it's a religious film. Um, which Ben, you mentioned the Hays Code, and this one, you you hardly ever see a movie so willingly reject female sexuality or like um, mm -hmm. just yeah sexuality in general and mm -hmm. Robert Mitchum's character plays that role by crushing it before it even happens or scorning it as it's happening in front right. of him. Like we get yeah. that in a couple scenes and it's almost like the, the haze code at work. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> There's a drag race code. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, no um, worries. Yeah, I just, I think that's interesting and we can go in later about how yeah. uh, Charles Lawton like his views on religion and maybe why he chose to crush the feminine intrigue that way. Um, but that goes hand in hand with how it kind of defies genre. Yeah. I what read, uh, as I was reading um, up on it beforehand, uh, A.O. Scott described it as a, a hybrid of a folk tale and a film noir. And I thought that was a pretty good, you know, but, but, it, but you're right. There's, there's horror elements, there's, you know, thriller elements, uh, there's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you, you can't really put it very easily in a box as with a lot of great films. It's just kind of all over the place. So, um, uh, Clinton, I think all the rest of us have talked. Was there anything else you wanted to? <laughs> uh, yeah, like I talk about this movie um, for years, but uh, uh, the fact that we were just talking about the Hayes Code and a lot of the restrictions put upon, uh, put upon the film, I think that's worthwhile to note is that, um, as is the case with a lot of great art, this film had a lot going against it, and it was because of those restrictions that they had to think outside the box, not only um, content-wise with the censorship of the time, but also uh, production-wise. Like um, on the special features that we watched about the film, they talked about how the movie was made for around six hundred thousand dollars, so well short of a million, which even back then was not much money to make a movie, especially not a studio film. And because of that, they weren't on location hardly at all. And even the iconic river sequence, which is like one of the most beloved scenes in the film was all shot on a set, which is right. unbelievable. And this, and the sky in the background, like that's just a backdrop, like they're not outside at all. And it's just right. these Amazing. innovative and genius ways to use these studio um, restrictions to their benefit. And I think um, going along with that, I think this movie is almost metatextual in that the preacher character could be the embodiment of the Hayes Code himself and is showing how mm -hmm. the uh, religious uh, censorship from the Catholic Legion of Decency from all these different groups at the time were um, stifling natural uh, sexuality and expression mm -hmm. and art and in life itself but at the, at the time. same time like yeah. promoting violence which this movie does so mm -hmm. i have big beef with the codes and the mpa with that but yeah, yeah that's a good point is that it lets violence onto the screen but not sexuality yeah something yeah. we still do <laughs> <laughs> but I, Although, I, go, I, go ahead I, was, I think the Hayes codes a super interesting point because one another thing that really jumped out to me like very clearly is that I've never seen a movie show no sexuality, but acknowledge female sexuality so poignantly <laughs> and, and like so in your face. There are so few films that, especially at the time, that would allow a recently widowed woman who already has two children to openly acknowledge that she is a sexual being 
and wants that from another person. Granted, yeah. her husband, but is still right. like, is like, yeah, this is what I want, and I want this. And even the the older woman who talks about like, I just lay there and think about canning or whatever. Just that <laughs> sentence alone is enough to be like, oh yeah, this old woman is still having sex. She's a sexual yeah. person. <laughs> like she may not enjoy it all the time yeah. because he doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> but like, I well, I just the acknowledgement of female sexuality is really interesting. Yeah. Well, and I think just sexuality in general. I think for a code film, it's pretty. There's 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 a lot there. Yeah. I think about you know the scenes where he goes into the you know strip clubs and is yeah. you know watching the women dance, and then you know I mean I mean God how like symbolic can you get with his like switchblade yeah. knife that like, pops yeah. up out of his pants yeah. as he's watching them, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it brings that. But uh, Clinton, going back to something you talked about, uh, about the night scenes, and that's one of my favorite things about this film is, um, and that's why I, I so often think about it from that kind of production design and lighting sort of perspective is they, there is such a dichotomy between daytime and nighttime in this movie. And all of the daytime scenes are filmed very realistically, um, very, you know, like it's almost a, you know, documentary sort of style. And the night times are these incredibly stylized, just nightmare scapes. And it's, yeah. it's, not, um, it's not going for realism in any way. And just the extremely overt, you know, symbolism. I love the, the scene in, uh, in the, uh, their bedroom right with the giant art the very obviously like kind of church steeple like mm -hmm. arch ceilings and it's but it's stark like that's that's all there is and um and and again i just i i love that i mean this it's a gonzo film i mean it goes there those those nighttime scenes i mean there's there's like guillermo del toro level like you know uh just kind of weirdness and and nightmare imagery to those and, and again, it's just when you see it's something you don't always expect in a film from this time period, but it's it's very much in this film. Totally. That was one of the things that struck me most when I first watched it was the I guess it's a dichotomy between the real nature, you know, like the bottom of the lake versus the silhouetted barn and farmhouse when you get at the end of the river scene. It's mm -hmm. so striking and maybe in a different context it would look cheap. But in this mm -hmm. one, it's just so terrifying yet simply beautiful and i think that's mm -hmm. what this movie is in general is just beauty and terror yeah. from a child's perspective which is very unique in itself but i think accomplishes the um the merge between the two so perfectly so uniquely and um yeah i loved like thinking back to um like the cabinet of dr caligari when i was watching this movie because there's no denying the fact that those shadows and those obscure um, oblong shapes come from, like are inspired by that type of filmmaking from the silent era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, oh, and just to uh, add on to that real quickly, I think the point of view of the children in the film is really interesting. Like there's not that many movies in the history of at least mainstream Hollywood that are told from a child's perspective that takes it in a mature way. Like this isn't a, like, like kids could enjoy this movie, but it is not like a simplistic morality <laughs> tale. It's, yeah. it's legitimately- Clint, Clinton, I'm a, Clinton, I'm a parent and I'm not showing this to my kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it's a bit of a nightmare fuel. And um, yeah. it's <laughs> like, it's really interesting because um, just the, like if you watch this movie again from a production design standpoint, like it's so interesting to see how they just designed the um, the sets and even like the neon lights um, on some of the door fronts to be a little um, off scale, like bigger than it actually would be in real life. But from the perspective of a child, it makes sense. Yeah. And the iconic um, crescendo of the river scene with the uh, Silhouetted Barn is a great example of that, where it's like this, almost this pop-up out of a children's book. And um, it and normally it might look a little cheap and fake, but in this movie, it works so well to the atmosphere. Because again, I think this movie could be described as kind of a fairy tale or like a children's book brought to life. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I just, uh, I threw up here on the screen, um, uh, and I, you guys, I'm guessing, are familiar with uh, Cinephilia and Beyond, the great website that just kind of 
really uh, it go, tends to go kind of film by film, but for any film that they have an entry on, they really do an amazing job of compiling resources that are out there. And um, I would recommend checking uh, the entry out on this particular film. I was just there today, had a lot of great things I hadn't seen before. I had the, um, there's a, a film, uh, Charles Lawton directs Night of the Hunter, which I guess is an, is an extra on the Criterion uh uh, disc, I think it said. So maybe you guys have seen that, but had a lot of that information as well, as well as some um, just uh, great information. You know, there's a real kind of debate about uh, uh, James Agee, uh, versus, uh, the screenwriter versus Charles Lawton, the director, and kind of, you know, that sort of auteurship debate, you know, who, um, you know, who's, who's responsible for this. And you can get some fuel on there as well. I was going through this up there. We also had a, a Tony th uh, chimed in. He said, uh, Paul Gregory, he mentioned earlier, he said he went to Des Moines Lincoln. I think I said he went to Des Moines Roosevelt. So, um, oh, yeah. so Tony, Tony's right on that. But uh, but uh, definitely uh, Paul Gregory, a, a Des Moines guy. And um, uh, if you didn't, kept, for those who, who came in late, um, we talked about that a little bit earlier, and you can catch that kind of on the rebroadcast, but definitely one of the more uh, interesting points here. So um, I mentioned the James Agee thing because coming from more of a screenwriting background myself, I'm always kind of interested in some of these, you know, auteurship, you know, questions and, and particularly I tend to take the sort of aggrieved screenwriter perspective, um, you know, where <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there's just people are so often, uh, you know, just want to assign everything to, you know, to the director. And one of the things that Cinephilia there you can see is they do have a, a copy of a, a screenplay. Now, you don't know how late in the process the screenplay it's from, it's not really documented real well there. Uh, Lawton reportedly did some some screenwriting work on it towards the end too, as directors often do. So, you know, who knows? But in, in looking at the screenplay as they have it, you can see, you know, a lot of the elements in the film laid out in AG's screenplay. And I think a lot of those kind of thematic elements and things like that we talked about there, you know, really were there in the, in the screenplay. And of course, this is based on a novel as well. I don't know, have you guys read, anybody read the novel? I have not read it, but we have, we saw in the supplements that in the credits, like they actually um, noted that the author got, you know, first uh, billing and then AG did. And so okay. they were saying how the book was written so cinematically that mm. they shared so much of the credit because it really was almost already done. They just had to sort of transfer it into film talk and cut, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So, um, yes, yeah. So, um, what, what, uh, what else? Anything else you guys want to hit on? I mean, obviously, we could talk for hours about. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had a couple things. Um, one is that from the uh, behind the scenes of the movie, um, it was revealed that uh, apparently Lawton, who again I can't stress this enough, this was his first and last movie as a director, and what a shame that this was the only movie that he directed because it's brilliant. But regardless, to prep for this first directing job of his, he watched a lot of D.W. Griffith movies. Um, and, and he wanted to make this movie, although it was made well into the sound era in the mid fifties, like he wanted it to have that kind of atmosphere and the, I guess the grammar of silent film. And it's just interesting because uh, in the movie, he cast Lillian Gish, who was a silent film icon who worked with Griffith a lot. And so that's kind of a, as I said, um, on the special features, like that was like a flesh and blood connection to Griffith, to that lost mm -hmm. era. And uh, secondly, I would just like to note that this movie, although it was kind of dismissed upon a um, misrelease, it's since gotten a lot of reappraisal and a claim that is rightfully deserved and its um, influence is pretty far reaching as the love and hate symbols on uh, Mitchum's knuckle or um, on his on his knuckles uh, is referenced in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing with Radio Rahim and mm -hmm. of course in the classic yeah. episode of The Simpsons <laughs> A Fear with uh, Sideshow Bob. Although in that version, because The Simpsons characters have four fingers, it's spelled L-U-V, so, but I just had to mention that. I definitely yeah. did think that the love and hate thing was from Do the Right Thing. <laughs> when I saw this, I was yeah. like, oh, never mind. I was wrong. Yeah. So. That's cool. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I will always I'll appreciate for the rest of my life that uh, salvation is found in a cranky old single woman with many children who she yells at. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it always? Yeah, clearly.
that's my goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. And I, I feel like the Lillian Gish character and that is, is maybe the one part of this that maybe hasn't aged as well as the rest of it. And it yeah. feels a, a little kind of um, stock, maybe just the idea of this, you know, completely loving kind of character. But I, I still think there's some interesting elements there. And I, I think her performance is great. I mean, she's just, you know, I mean, just such a like kind of powerhouse force there, too. But you know, it's also interesting and, and like without deviling, delving too much into the kind of re religiosity of it, I've always found it interesting that, you know, Mitchum's character purports to be a preacher. And anytime he's preaching, he's he's kind of telling these like nonsense stories about good battling evil. And it sort of has this sort of heightened biblical sounding language, but it's not anything from, you know, the Bible or religious tradition. Lillian Gish, on the other hand, is, you know, uh, reading to, um, you know, reading to the children directly from the Bible, etc. So, um, you know, there's definitely a reading there of kind of, you know, true, you know, kind of religious faith versus this kind of uh, bastardized amalgam that Robert Mitchin is pointing. Um, here's a great point here um, that Joe points out um, that that Irish shot of the basement window that that's a great point. That, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. The closing of it, and I was just I was actually I've been looking in the other window here to look back. The um, the the cinematographer uh, of the film, because um, I, I read this earlier today. Uh, Stanley Cortez was his name, and I was just trying to find a list of his other films. Um, but he uh, he did a, he directed a lot of uh, films. I think going all the way back to the silent era, in particular, a lot of black and white films. And so, um, and it kind of mentioned that at the time this was shot too, because this is pretty late for black and white films as well. And, um, you know, but yeah, you talk about someone who knew how to use black and white, uh, you know, film. I mean, it's so, so striking. And, and I think Joe's point there is great too, that, that, that Irish shot closing is absolutely, uh, you know, silent era and just kind of perfectly utilized here. So, um, all right. Shall we, shall we move from the very, very high to the very, very uh, uh, Netflix? I don't know. What do you guys? Yeah. High brow to. I'm not sure what brow, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's there's no brow. This is unibrow. So, this is unibrow territory. Olivia, I feel like you had the maybe the strongest take on extraction. Uh, I don't know if it's a take. I mean, it's only it's a it's a intense feeling because I just watched it like like literally like an hour ago I, I, it was over and I just breathed my sigh of relief mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, no it's just I mean it's just bad like it's just, I don't know it's the it's that perfect, <laughs> it's that perfect mix of like things I've seen before and hate and new things that I haven't seen that are also bad <laughs> no <laughs> so I guess the the thing that turned me off immediately was you know, in the first 10 minutes, you can tell that it's generic buff white guy is going to mow down a thousand nondescript brown people, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is never fun to watch. And but then at the same time, we have this backstory of this buff white guy. And it's like, oh, he lost his child to uh, lymphoma, which is tragic. But when you see him mow down thousands of people that we are supposed to believe are bad guys, potentially are, we don't know who these people are. They are all sort, they're like from a gang. Some of them are police, some of them are military. Some of them are just random people who also have guns. It's just, it doesn't land. Like the, the, the emotion doesn't land when, I, when you do that, I think. It also feels, I think with that particular element, but also just the entire movie, felt very much like a video game to me. Oh yeah. It had the feeling of a video game where there's like different levels. You're like, oh, this is the mansion level and this is the sewer <laughs> level. And now you're crossing yes. the, the, the climax of the movie is like this kid has to, this kid that he's protecting has to make his mad dash to the other side of the bridge. And there's like all these cars around that they're using as strategic cover. And I was like, this is a video game. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've played this before. <laughs> Now, now I have to ask: do, do you like any movies like this? Because this is definitely of a type. This is a definitely a type of movie. Uh, I like movies like I thought this would be. Gotcha. <laughs> I like a fun action romp. Like I love mm -hmm. like a Mission Impossible or like a yeah. 
you know, yeah. James Bond or something. Right. I don't like the really like self serious like movie like this that wants to think it's about something. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. you're not, I know you're not. And yeah. you're not trying hard enough to be about something. Right. T to me, the movie that from just about the first moment in and all the way through, I kept thinking of was Commando, the, ah, the, Schwarze yeah. the Schwarzenegger film Commando. And, and really just kind of 80s, you know, kind of... Yeah muscle man, you know, mow down hundreds. Uh, of non yeah. foreigners. Yeah. 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 And general, exactly. You know, and I, and, and, and I have to admit, I, I can certainly enjoy a film like that. I, I really, I like I'm actually, I, just, I do like that movie. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, but, but it, it, so it, then it also sort of made me think, well, what is it? Like, why do I enjoy, you know, certain films like that? Well, Commando as like a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger films is fun because he has a very funny accent. And so okay. it's, it's funny when he says words. And so, <laughs> and, and he's very buff and he takes, you know, he, uh, you know, there's a lot, you know, kills a lot of people and gets in a lot of fights and things like that. But um, and he's buff in a way that's like cartoony. So it gives it like yes. a, it's like a separation there where you're like, oh, I know what this is. This is different. I, I agree. And, and that was one thing that I actually didn't appreciate here because I from I think most of this film I thought was going in that kind of cartoony direction. I mean, like the yeah. the brief introduction at the beginning of like, well, he's you know he's whatever kind of like expert special forces guy, and you meet his team yeah. of, who, of who cares, you know, yeah. no, just fodder, do right? but, but <laughs> the movie does a pretty good job of they don't really spend that much time on that either because they're kind of like, yeah, this is you know just kind of whatever. Um, so that I that I kind of enjoyed and appreciated. But yeah, the whole the kind of the flashbacks to his like trauma with his child, I kind of felt like yeah. you know, like we don't I don't think this is that movie. Yeah. Um, but so. I just that but this is where like something like a Mission Impossible like really shines because like yeah. the first Mission Impossible starts out and you're like, oh the team right. of whoever, blah, blah, blah. And then they just get annihilated. And you're like, whoa, this is different. This is something else. <laughs> this yeah. is not what I thought. And this there's nothing in here that happened that I was like. Right. Ooh, didn't think that was gonna go like this. Yeah. And every beat, I was like, "Yep, that's what happens next." <laughs> yeah. Well, so the one of the things that I had me thinking about this, and this is maybe thinking more about like kind of what are Netflix movies in general. And I, I, I think I made this joke, like kind of a joke comment, maybe a week ago on social media, and ended up like talking with a bunch of people about this as well. But I feel like so much Netflix content, Netflix film content, to me, it's very like direct to video. Like this, this is a film that I would have expected to see, you know, if this, if we were back in like the nineties, this would have been like a Steven Seagal or a Jean-Claude Van Damme film that, you know, was like at the checkout, you know, aisle at Target. And you were like, oh, was that one that was in theaters? I don't remember seeing ads for, and it wasn't because it's just, you know, kind of another, you know, uh, you just kind of, you know, glomming on there. And so, um, but at the same time, Netflix has a huge, huge amount of, of money, right? And so this film doesn't star like old fat Steven Seagal or Corbin Burnson or whoever would have, you know, starred in a direct to video film of the past. It's, you know, uh, you know, Chris Hemsworth, who's like pretty like a list action movie guy. And, uh, you know, this film was written by the Russo brothers who, you know, did, you know, the, the sort of impresarios of the, Avengers films and whatnot, right? That so that's a lot of kind of A-list talent, but in you know still relatively kind of direct to video e level material. And yeah. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess I don't know that I have like a point about that, but I guess it's just more of an observation. How do you guys yeah. feel about that, you... or does that seem related to just what you feel like Netflix films sort of are becoming? Or first thing I thought of was their first. I think it was their first one. Um, Beast of No Nation with one, yeah. was, there, was there only one star in that movie? Idris uh, Elba? Yeah, Idris Elba. Yeah, so I mean, that's kind of got the same themes, I guess, that you pointed out in that movie. What were you saying? Um, right. I, and that's, yeah, I, that's a little more of, they do, and I, I should say, I mean, Netflix does have their kind of prestige movie wing too, right? Yeah. And you've, got, like films like Roma, yeah. and you've got films like uh, the, uh, the Irishman, right? You They, they have some of those. But those like are so stand, you know what I mean? Those like you can see those yeah. from a mile away. Like this is one of the prestige projects. But I feel like just kind of in the scroll 
most of the films, it's more kind of stuff like this that to me is more of that like direct to video. It's like the stuff that would have sold to like foreign audiences at the American film market. It's just that kind of schlock really. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And maybe it's because I don't hear a lot about their lesser known movies or their non prestige projects, but um, uh, it's interesting the um, environment that we're in with Netflix films because it is like the direct to video rack, but just on the rack, you also have like, like you have a Jean Claude Van Damme movie, but then right next to it, you have Goodfellas. And it's like, one of these is not like the other. And that's kind of the case here. Yeah. Like you have a Scorsese movie and then a movie like Tall Girl about a tall girl who's bullied. And it's like, what is this? And yeah. um, uh, and you have movies by Coron with Roma and the Coen brothers with uh, Buster Scruggs and Bong Joon-ho. Mm -hmm. Okja, yeah. With yeah. Okja. And you even have, like even brought um, Orson Welles Back from the Dead right. to direct the other side of the wind, which is insane. Yeah. But um, yeah, like it's okay. a yeah, um, it's a very strange mixture of like quality, almost auteur cinema mixed in with this uh, movie rack stuff. Yeah, I you know yeah. it reminded me I had a like one of my film professors uh, back when I was in film school. He directed a lot of. Uh, his, his nickname was Johnny Fortnite because he could he could crank out a feature in two weeks. And so he directed a bunch of like uh, Hallmark movies and sci-fi channel movies and like a lot of those. You, you can picture exactly those kind of movies, you know, and he, you know, he could those out. And it was a lot of this stuff that, you know, like I mentioned, the American film market, it was those kind of films that get uh back then anyway and some of the financial models have changed you know but a lot of those films they they were financed by pre-selling the foreign rights to them and so you would sell you would sell like tv rights in all of these countries around the world and you'd sell it based on the cover and uh you know or the poster and the the star and so and I, it's funny i mentioned corbin bernson earlier and i realized it's because he told us at the time that corbin bernson was like the biggest guy to get for that kind of film like all you know all of those kind of in that world because he was like kind of a star and like kind of recognizable overseas but like cheap enough that they could you know put him in the you know these kind of things and those films like especially in those foreign markets you know they they get booked to kind of play on these tv channels and stuff and it's just basically they could be in the background and it just kind of seems like a, a bigger movie you know or it seems like some kind of more maybe legitimate or whatnot, you know, more serious film, um, but it's not, it doesn't really have that level of quality. And I just feel like with the sort of infinite scroll of Netflix, that's kind of, I, I feel like we're, I just keep seeing more things like this or like the, just like they had that kind of comedy action thing with uh, Adam Sandler and uh, um, oh gosh, who was the love interest in that. But um, uh, Jennifer Aniston, I think. Does that sound right? Oh, man. See, I could be yeah. making this up. You don't know, because it's just a yeah, I, you, and... <laughs> well, <laughs> watch movie yeah, on Netflix. I mean, probably... oh. yeah, yeah, well, there's, you can't. There's, there's very few movies on Netflix anyway, but the ones that are, to me, they feel like they're more like this kind of background. I mean, like, this to me is a movie to, like, have on in the background while you're doing something else and you know maybe which admittedly like, is what i did yeah that's what <laughs> I, that, that's more, that's basically what i did too that said there was also at least in the middle there was that one really impressive long shot uh, okay so i was reading i was reading letterbox reviews of this after i like went through because i was like one star had maybe half so bad yeah. and then I, I saw that there were like some two two and a half so i was like what and they all talked about this tracking shot. And I was like, I missed yeah. it. I totally yeah. did because it was background noise. Like this is for like, a, you know, I was doing right. stuff and walking around. And I was right. like, well, I missed that entirely. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, and, and to be fair, I would say the action and the fight sequences in this in general are really high quality. And I guess the guy, the guy who's the director is like a fight choreographer type yeah. guy. And you can see that it's, it's, you know, they're really well done. And yeah, there's that, there's, there's one point in the middle where he's kind of, and it's mm -hmm. it, you know yeah it's kind of like a uh you know coron esque kind of you know they you know they run through a building and out onto a roof and they jump onto yeah. another roof and they fall down and somebody gets hit by a car and then they're walking away and then another car comes. and just one of these 
you know, yeah, I did laugh. That that was goes, what's that? I said, I did laugh. That was, that bit was good. It was. It I don't was. know if it was played for comedy, but I did like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it was a pretty good, it, I mean, it was a pretty good piece of filmmaking, I think in there yeah. too, as well. So anyway, there's some elements in there, but, uh, yeah. Um, we, we thought everybody wanted to know uh, what, what we thought about extraction. So I'm glad we, uh, we took some time. To I've been, been ranking up the, or the racking up the like four, four and a half star reviews on my letterbox. So it's good. It's good to bring me down and get a, get a good right. one and a half. It reminds you of what is good. Yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah, always yeah. got to recalibrate. So have yeah. you, have you seen Corpus Christi yet? Yes. Yes. Big right. fan. Yeah. I was going to say fire up your four and a half, five. Star yeah. I think, I think I gave it like four and a half. I was really, really into Corpus Christi. Nice. That's yeah. probably what I would give it to, except I've decided no half stars in my letterbox. I can't handle no half stars. Goodreads doesn't use half stars, and now I don't use Goodreads anymore. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> There's a huge difference between three and three and a half. I I was a uh, I was like the editor at the Iowa State Daily, you know, years ago when I was in college, like the A and E editor, and I insisted on no half stars. I said, if you want half stars, go to a ten star scale. But the thing is, if you went to a 10 star scale, people would still try to use half stars. Yeah. Be like, this is an eight and a half star movie. So, Ron Tomatoes style. <laughs> just let's yeah, yeah, just yeah. Yeah. Of just, just, numbers. Just They're down. all there. Come on. Yeah. Or like AV Club or something, they do like out of 100. I'm like, that's too much pressure. That's too. <laughs> I can't do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or pitchfork album reviews that go out to a decimal place. Oh, God. They'll, they'll, they'll yeah. give an album like 6.7. It's like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, one string on the guitar differently, it might be a 6.8, but. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, too precise. No, absolutely. Um, so anyway, we're kind of running uh, up against our time. We try to wrap things up here, so I suppose we should. But uh, Corpus Christi that we just mentioned, I would definitely encourage people, check it out. It's now playing in our virtual cinema. Um, it's going to be there for uh, about another uh uh, almost another two weeks. It just opened on Friday. Uh, really great film. Um, also about a well, a, a young man posing as a priest. Very different kind of film than Night of the Hunter. Yeah. That's what kind of led us there. But uh, really, really a beautiful film. Was Academy Award nominated. Um, look forward to talking about that soon. Um, any Anything else before I wrap up? Anything else you guys have seen you wanted to... Okay. Oh, I watched... Um... For the first time recently, I watched It's Always Fair Weather with uh, Gene Kelly and uh, Michael Kidd and someone else. Uh, and I watched it because I, I month and month ago, I had seen the, the clip of the, um, the roller skating bit, the roller skating uh, dance sequence on Facebook or something. And I was like, well, I need to watch whatever that's from. And uh, I'm also reading a biography of Gene Kelly right now. He's one of my like all-time favorite mm -hmm. people. And um, it's just... I, I think the movie is quite good, but just that scene alone is just like he does a whole dance sequence on roller skates throughout like city streets and just the oh, most wow. amazing feat of dancing I think I've ever seen. And Sid, ties really, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sid Charisse is a love interest again, and she's a vision to behold. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That ties really into the really well into the movie we just watched. Um, Shall we dance? Where Fred Astaire and Junior Rogers do a whole scene mm. on uh, roller skates as well more dance scenes on roller skates yeah. <laughs> yeah they're really great yeah yeah and that's when they sing um uh you say either i say either and they you know go into the whole bit yeah so we've been thinking that around the house lately <laughs> those songs get stuck in your head yeah. <laughs> nice. what have you that's, seen ben that's nice i i actually haven't seen either of those so i should uh i think I it's always for weather is like 199 to rent on amazon or something oh wow yeah no, that'd be that'd be a fun one. That'd be a fun one to check out. So, yeah. well, and your Olivia, your film recommendation is Singing oh. in the Rain. Yes, it is always and forever, but especially now. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I was glad to see that. That was one I definitely thought about too, in terms of like, what's a movie that's just gonna like cheer you up? <laughs> just, I just, I, I just, I watched it like maybe three weeks into like quarantine or whatever, with on a virtual thing with a friend of mine, mm -hmm. and we were both really in the depths of like, I can't handle this. Like, it's getting to be too much. And we watched it together. And at the end, my friend called me and she goes, that's the happiest I have felt in weeks. <laughs> and I was very much in agreement. It's just, it's just instant happiness. Yeah, yeah, so. All righty. Well, uh, thank you guys so much. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, yeah, thanks. To, thanks to folks who 
watched us on the stream and uh, many more people seem to check us out later on on Facebook, which we really appreciate too. So um, thanks for, for checking us out. And if you uh, ever have any uh, thoughts on uh, about anything we've talked about or anything you're interested in talking about with us or you want to engage, get your thoughts on here, we, we definitely want to make this a uh, you know, real kind of community conversation. So um, we will be back next, uh, next Monday. We're planning on talking about Corpus Christi next Monday. So um, do be sure you check that out from our virtual cinema. And uh, yeah, I guess until then, uh, take care, guys. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>